Okay, thank you guys for coming to the first, um, the first of our uh, Visiting Artists and Scholars lecture series. Um, I printed out the whole schedule on this fluorescent pink because why not? Um, uh, it's a calendar here. One side has the fall exhibition schedule. My name's Courtney Kessel, sorry, hi. A lot of you know me. <laughs> um, I'm the gallery director for the two galleries on campus. I'm also co-chair of the Visiting Artists Committee. So um, that's why I am charged with this. So um, pick one of these up for future reference. The back has, well, this will be the only time that this back, this schedule's printed out for um, the year. So um, it's up here, can't miss it. Um, you guys go up because it's not gonna be a good spot there. <laughs> Sorry, I know that I can harass them a little bit. Um, I'm also a very nervous public speaker, so I prepared some things. <laughs> um, thinking that you've all sort of read her bio already, I'm not gonna do sort of a traditional, just read what, I already, what you've already seen or heard, um, and kind of get into the why I, I actually know Irene <laughs> a little bit better than any of the other visiting artists um, on our schedule. Um, Irene and I have been, or rather, some, sorry, get right into it. Um, Irene and I have been, or rather, our work has been in a growing international circle of cultural producers, exhibiting and presenting for a few years now. But it wasn't until last year that we met in person in Edmonton, Canada, for the third and final new Maternalisms exhibition and collo colloquium curated by Nat Natalie Loveless. A couple years before that, in 2014, Irene curated my work into an exhibition at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she now teaches. Um, called Complicated Labors with many of this international group. And at that same year, we were both part of Loveless's second um, New Maternalism at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Santiago, Chile. It was there that I was struck by the profundity of her work. Chloe and I were there, Chloe's my daughter, for those of you that don't know, um, were there preparing to perform my piece and saw Irene's maternity test, which you can see on her website. Her website's really, um, really great. Um, we both stood there, me teary-eyed at the admission of these women and, looking, and her, Chloe, looking at me asking questions. What is a C-section? Why do mothers need to have them? Why didn't you have one? Why are you crying? Irene has coined and used the term performative documentary to describe her work. Yours and Sisterhood, which you'll see a lot of tonight, um, 40 Years Maternity Test are examples of this, involving actors and non-actors, volunteers or paid, who believe in the value of the work to recount and quote, reframe, recuperate, and reanimate forgotten and neglected histories, often beginning with rigorous research and archives. Her work brings historical materials into conversation with the present day, inviting viewers to explore historical spaces in a way to contemplate larger questions of politics, ideology, and the production of personal, collective, and national memories, end quote. That is stolen from her bio, which I said I wasn't going to read. <laughs> In some cases, we don't know that the women on the screen aren't those who are, were actually affected and realize that it doesn't matter, or maybe it matters more, to have these actors stand in for you or me or her or she from the present or 40 years ago. What does matter is the idea that hashtag yes all women means women, women's, a, any woman's problem is a women's problem. Nearing the end of being on the road for the past two weeks, Irene and her assistant, Anita, is up there in the middle, um, have traveled through eight states recording 30 plus people reading letters written over four years ago. This leg of the trip was focused on Detroit, Philadelphia, DC, Pittsburgh, West Virginia, through Ohio, and finishing in Indiana, which is why we're fortunate to have her here tonight. Her project and mine have come full circle. I'm crowdsourcing a new performance piece in which I have asked women, friends, family, and colleagues from around the world to create a sort of coming of age offering for my daughter who will turn 13 in October. Irene merged her work and research to offer a curated selection of letters, letters written by 13-year-old girls from the 1970s to MS Magazine. As she is stating in, with Yours and Sisterhood, this project merges historical and current political issues that are still relevant in many aspects for women and girls today, and reiterates, reminds, retells our cultural amnesia surrounding feminin, fem, feminism's history stating that the personal is still political. Irene Lustig is a filmmaker, visual artist, archival researcher, and amateur seamstress, whose work, whose work is recognized and has been screened in numerous film archives, museums, and festivals around the world. She's received numerous grants, awards, and fellowships for her work and research. 
that you can read that on her website. Please join me in welcoming Irene. Thank you, Courtney. That was a really lovely introduction. Um, that was very nice. Um, and I'm happy my bio says I'm a filmmaker, archival researcher, and amateur seamstress, which is true. And people are always editing out the amateur seamstress part because it seems like unprofessional. But I am all of those things. So, um, so um, as Courtney, uh, Courtney gave you a little bit of uh, background about uh, my work in general and um, the projects I'm working on now. Um, so what my plan is for this evening is to maybe spend 10 minutes or so um, just giving you a little bit of background about the project I'm working on now and its method, um, and then actually just to screen a bunch of stuff for you guys. So I'll show maybe like 30 minutes of materials. Um, this is an unfinished project. It's a work in progress. Um, I love showing it unfinished. Um, I think I learn a lot more from conversations of unfinished work than finished work. Um, and I've been presenting this project for a while as I've been making it in different like, spaces like this and conferences and other kinds of spaces. Um, and yeah, every time I think I learn from what people's questions are or um, what people's responses are. Um, and I try to show different pieces every time I present the work. Um, and I also, when I present the work in different places, I try to show some stuff from that place. Um, so I've actually included a couple of new things from Ohio that I filmed um, very recently last week. Um, it's nice to show Ohio stuff in Ohio. So, um, so just for a bit of background, um, I'm a filmmaker, visual artist, um, an archival researcher. Um, I would say pretty much all of my projects begin with some kind of question about history, something that's kind of bothering me or interesting me or making me curious about history. Um, and also a lot of my projects begin with some kind of engagement with an archive. Um, in a lot of my projects, that's a moving image archive, so I've worked a lot with archival film materials. Um, I've made a number of projects that kind of use or repurpose or kind of reconfigure, reimagine archival film materials to think in new ways about something historical. Um, I spend a lot of time in moving image archives. So this, this project is actually a bit of a new thing for me um, in that there's no archival material that you see on screen when you watch the film. Um, it's still very much a project that comes out of archival research um, and archival work, um, but not a moving image archive, but an archive of letters. So it's a kind of physical paper archive that's the beginning of this project. Um, how many people know this image? I'm just curious. <coughs> like four, okay. <laughs> um, so lately when I've been presenting materials, uh, for this project, I've been starting with this image. Um, this is uh, an image from August 26, 1970. Um, this is about 50 years after the 19th Amendment was passed, which is the amendment granting women the right to vote in the United States. Um, and this was the first really big, giant women's march that was um, organized by second wave feminists, by Betty Friedan and um, NOW. And this was um, this is really the first kind of show of strength and show of numbers um, in the women's movement in the 70s. Um, about 50,000 women showed up and stopped traffic on Fifth Avenue, like a giant busy street in New York City. Um, and it was a very significant, um, I think, historical moment for thinking about women's movement and thinking about um, what can be accomplished when people get together in numbers to express themselves. Um, and then, of course, this image um, probably looks more familiar to more of you. Um, this is the Women's March um, this past January 2017. Um, so about 500,000 people who marched in Washington, D.C., about 4.8 million participants worldwide. Um, and I show these two images together. Um, I, think, um, I think, you know, I'm always, all the time, thinking across history and thinking about the past and the present and how they speak to each other in all of my work. Um, but I think that idea feels especially um, urgent and timely to me right now. Um, I've been making this project for the past three years, um, so I've very much been shooting this project that's about feminism and about women's issues, as Courtney has said. Um, I've been making it alongside the election. Um, so I shot, you know, I shot all over the Midwest about two weeks before the election. I filmed all over the South about a week after the election. Um, so the interactions that I've been having with people as I make this project have very much followed the current political moment. Um, I think feminism has really um, come back to us as a kind of urgent matter that um, matters a lot right now, that's you know, full of unresolved, unfinished business. Um, 
And I think, you know, I think it's important, it has been important for me to think about the urgency of the histories that I'm considering in this project. Um, I think as, as, you know, a lot of historians probably share this with me, um, when you make work about history, about things that are old or forgotten or a long time ago, um, it often feels like a difficult task to convince people that this history matters or that it's important or to kind of follow you into considering something from a long time ago. Um, and this project actually has felt very different to me and it's a new feeling for me to feel like history is urgent, history is incredibly present, um, history is incredibly timely, um, and that perhaps thinking about a certain history from 40 years ago can be a kind of space of resistance um, that's really resonant in the current political moment. Um, so this project is, is based on archival research, um, reading letters to the editor to Ms. Magazine. And I'm again curious to know how many of you are familiar with Ms. Not a lot. So this is very normal. So my students, I teach, and none of my students, even my students who, who consider themselves feminists, none of them have heard of Ms., which is interesting. Um, so Ms. was the first um, kind of mainstream feminist magazine. It was founded in 1972. Um, by second wave feminists Gloria Steinem and Dorothy Pittman Hughes. Um, Gloria Steinem is probably a familiar name to some of you. Um, and you know, what was significant about this magazine, the 70s, there were tons and tons of different kinds of feminist publications. Um, but this magazine in particular was significant because it um, kind of went incredibly mainstream. And that was different from a lot of the more like fringe or independent or small press feminist publications that were happening at the same time. Um, so this magazine was all over the U.S. It was a magazine that you could find in a newsstand or a drugstore or subway station. Um, so really a magazine that was very visible, very accessible um, all over the U.S. Um, so then what that meant is that for many people um, in the 70s, and particularly people in not in big cities like New York or L.A., where there was lots of feminist stuff going on, um, for a lot of people this was their only access to kind of feminist thinking, feminist ideas, feminist media. Um, the magazine was read by a huge number of people. Um, and what very quickly happened is that people began writing letters to the editor of Ms. Magazine. And the magazine basically would just receive mountains of mail every week, hundreds and hundreds of letters, way more letters than they could possibly publish. And then at a certain point uh, in the 80s, the magazine donated the letters to, um, to a library. So those are, it's just a public collection that's open to researchers, and you can read like a few thousand letters that were sent to the editor. Which and I like a... Um, which library is in? Oh, it's in the Schlesinger Library. It's the history uh, library of the history of women in America. It's part of the Radcliffe Institute, okay. which is kind of adjacent to Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, Radcliffe used to be the women's college, and now it's like a weird institute that it's like unclear what it is now that women can go to Harvard. Is, who knows what it is, but they have this fantastic library that's a women's histories library. Um, so these letters are now there, and I love showing the actual letters. I think uh, these images don't appear in my project, um, but I think there's a kind of incredible uh, material intimacy to just thinking about the handwriting, the stationery, the typewritten letters, um, that kind of idea of all of these different people sitting down and writing a physical paper letter and sending it in the mail. Um, and you know, the letters are, it's an amazing collection of letters. They're very intimate, very personal. Um, people tell stories about their lives. They're from all over the place. It's an incredibly diverse archive. Um, so to me, reading through these letters, it really quickly felt like a kind of literal invocation of the 70s slogan, the personal is political. Um, they're really, really amazing letters on this one's huge range of topics. Yeah, I, yeah. So uh, the editors did take notes on the letters, and those are also interesting to me. I'm gonna, I'm doing a kind of gallery version of this project in the winter, and I want to actually make a, a series of images called Margin Notes. That's just, just those in weird, often quite snarky um, editors <laughs> that I'm interested in. <laughs> Um, so I read a few thousand of these letters, and I then went home and made this kind of crazy map where I, I just started to think about all the different places where these letters came from. Um, and I think, you know, when I first imagined this project, I knew right away that I wanted to invite people today to perform these letters from 40 years ago and just see what happened or see what it might mean to um, ask people to read these letters that are from a long time ago. Um, but I think, you know, early on in the project, I think I kind of thought I would just go to, like, New York or some kind of really big diversity and film a whole bunch of people doing this and that that would be the project. <coughs> and then pretty early on as I read the letters, I think I very quickly started to feel like actually no, that, 
that's totally wrong because you know the women from the South, they're people writing letters from a small rural town in Iowa. Those are very different letters with very different concerns. And the people writing those letters have a very different relationship to the magazine that's you know, based in New York and different relationship to feminism, different access to feminist ideas. Um, so very early it started to feel like the geography of those letters felt really important to me. Um, and you can see, even looking at this map, that's a kind of, it's hard to see because it's so smushed together, but it is a kind of also, you know, a map of where liberal feminism was happening in the 70s. So you can sort of see where there's gaps and where there are not many letters and then where there's lots and lots of letters. Um, so obviously it's like the coast and the northeast and the college towns have more letters and the rural areas have less. Um, but it was interesting for me to really think about place and geography in terms of where conversation was happening. And I think, you know, the other thing that felt very significant to me about the archive and looking at this map is the idea um, of uh, many, many different people trying, to, trying really hard to have a big national conversation across really quite wide differences, wide geographical differences, wide ideological differences, um, but all sending letters to one place. So actually some of the letters are very conservative and not positive about the magazine. Some of the letters are way more radical than the magazine. Um, you know, many of the letters are, yeah, just from communities that wouldn't naturally be speaking to each other. And I think, um, you know, today in this moment where conversations are much more fragmented and happen online and there's no big giant public conversation that lots of people are trying to participate in together, um, I felt really interested in the kind of experimental, and most of my projects start with a question or an experiment or a thing I want to try out. Um, I think I really wanted to think about what would it look like or feel like to try to make a big national conversation all over the US using these 40 years ago materials right now and like how might it work or not work. Um, so that was kind of the point of departure for the project. So what I've been doing is, as Courtney kind of explained, since 2015, I've been traveling all over the US in this kind of, um, multi-part American road trip, I guess, to, to shoot this project. Um, so I've been at this point on uh, nine different trips that are like two to three weeks long um, to lots of different communities in the US. Um, the way I choose where I go is just based on that map of where the letters are from. So each letter is read in the place where it was written. Um, so there's a pretty strong geographical connection with the letter and the place it came from. Um, and I really like the idea of I'm actually inviting people, again, I've made lots of work with historical materials, and then I like show them to people like you guys in, in you know, cinemas or auditoriums, and I'm kind of inviting them to engage with history. Um, but I love with this project the idea that I'm in a much more direct way inviting each person who participates in the project to very directly engage with this piece of writing that's historical or from a long time ago. Um, it feels like a more immediate way to get at the thing that I'm interested in of kind of collapsing the present and the past. Um, so this is what I do in these towns. I have this kind of funny setup that's it's actually a portable teleprompter. Um, so I, I'm inviting people to read a letter um, from their town from 40 years ago off of this portable teleprompter system. And you'll see in the video what that looks like. Um, and I use a pretty labor intensive and personalized matchmaking process. So I'm not just giving people a random letter from their town. Um, but I actually spend quite a lot of time thinking pretty carefully about how to pair someone today up, um, usually a stranger, with a stranger from 40 years ago in ways that feel resonant or interesting or where I think something might happen. Um, and you know, sometimes I guess wrong, but often something interesting does happen and I think it is, I really do spend a lot of time. Um, people sign up for the project, we can talk more about this after if you're interested, but people sign up and they write a little bit about themselves when they sign up and often that's enough to figure out something that seems like it might be interesting in terms of pairing someone up with a letter. Um, so I have this process, I've been calling it um, critical casting, but I just made that term up. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, so this letter, just for example, this was a letter um, written it was an anti-nuclear letter written from Richland, Washington, which is where Hanford is. That's the big giant uh, plutonium production plant that made all of the plutonium for the bomb um, that was dropped in Nagasaki in 1945. Um, so the letter was from a woman whose father had died of bone cancer, who was kind of sounding an alarm about um, the you know, harm to human health that comes out of this, this town that's a kind of working class uh, power of nuclear industry town. 
and the woman who read the letter in 2015 is Trisha, who's herself also a nuclear activist. She grew up in Richland. She's a Richland downwinder. Um, and she's also someone whose family was really impacted by cancer due to exposure to radiation from the nuclear plant. Um, and it's quite, it's a really quite, it's an interesting town. It's a very toxic and interesting space. Um, but anyway, so she was someone who really identified with the letter that she read, and that was an interesting match. And so I really do that. Sometimes I'll spend weeks just on one letter trying to figure out like how to find someone who feels like the right reader for a certain letter. Um, so broadly, my project is invested in uh, empathetic and critical listening across history and across different perspectives. Um, I'm interested in the idea of re-speaking and embodiment, like what happens when you put someone else's words in your body and what kind of moment might that produce. Um, and really inviting people to respond to the feminist past in real time in the present. Um, and this is just a little, just to give you a sense of where it's been. I haven't, I sort of figured out at some point that going to all 50 states would be too crazy and too expensive, and my family would be mad at me. So um, I haven't done that, but I've kind of figured out a series of nine trips that I think cover every region. So I just wanted to in some way represent each region of the US. Um, and so you can see, like I filmed in Colorado, and that is kind of standing in for a bigger kind of Rockies, Western region. Um, there are places I haven't gone to, and usually those are places where there's very few letters. Um, if there's one letter in the whole state, um, I'm not always able to do that. And then this is the trip I'm on now, which includes Ohio. And this is the last trip, so I'm like two days away, basically, from finishing all of the shooting. Um, I will have filmed 300 or so, almost 300 people in 33 states. Um, in two days. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> and, uh, just to give you a, a little bit more of a sense of the technology that I'm working with, um, this is the kind of teleprompter I'm working with. Um, the teleprompter is something that usually you see in broadcast television or in like presidential addresses. So it's a technology where the text is reflecting back and up over a camera lens so that someone is able to kind of look at the camera and read a text that they have not memorized, but in real time. And I kind of, I like it, it, you know, it allows someone to look at the camera, which is nice. Um, but I think also for me it plays a little bit with the convention of broadcast television and the idea of public speech and official address. And I kind of like using that technology in an unlikely way with regular people on the street who are, you know, not famous or official people, um, but are kind of participating in that way of, of speaking. Um, so here's just another image of my little setup. Um, so just to give you a few of the questions that are my questions as I start the project, um, I think I started by really thinking about um, what we can learn, what might we learn from taking intergenerational feminism seriously. Um, how can we build feminist coalitions across geographical and ideological space, um, as well as across time? Um, and as well, what roles do things like conversation, talking, and listening, and embodying have to play in building new spaces of political action? So I think that's pretty much all I need to tell you about the project. I'm just going to move through, let's see how we're doing this time. Um, I'm going to show you a few of the readings. Um, I may skip around a little bit, depending on how we're doing with time. So yeah? You were saying that you have like 30 minutes. So huh? You were saying you have like 30 minutes. Yeah, but I can show less if I should show less. I think it's fine. Okay. All right. So I'll just jump right into it. Um, and then I'm happy to answer a few questions afterwards. To whom it may concern, I was a 70-year-old high school senior with an A average and a scholarship to college when I found I was pregnant with my whole life ahead of me. I was in no way ready, nor did I want a baby. So after battling my Catholic conscience, I had an illegal abortion. I was one of the luckier victims in that I made it to the hospital before I bled to death. Never again touched and hurt me. Having an abortion is not an easy decision to make, and it can be a tough one to live with. At least with legalized abortions, though, you can live. I suffer when I look at that picture and think of all my sisters who didn't make it. I hope that the article is read and understood for what it is, a rational, honest statement of the abortion problem. Sincerely, a reader in New York, please withhold my name. Uh, 
Yeah, no, it, it was no joke. Like you said, it was like a, a heavy, a heavy letter, and I, I think I empathize a lot with the with the writer because um, I do also come from a Catholic background, and we were all very uh, we were very hit hard with like pro-life propaganda and that sort of thing. And so when I when I did have my my own abortion. Um, uh, I think I felt the same way that I had to leave that behind and kind of um, make a decision for myself in thinking, you know, that I that I wasn't ready and um, that I didn't want a baby and, and that that was the right decision. And yeah, it's probably the best decision I made. <laughs> How does it feel that this letter was written for you? Really heavy, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, it's the fact that she says it was uh, an illegal abortion, and she's being, she says that she's thankful that abortion is legal and it's kind of safer to, to get it now. Um, I feel very lucky that I didn't have to resort to, to an illegal abortion and harm myself in the process of, of terminating a pregnancy. Dear Mr. Sharin, President of Kimberly Clark Corporation, we are writing to express our surprise and disappointment in your new product, a free sample of which was delivered to our homes unsolicited. The product is a tampon, in itself useful enough. To our disgust, however, each tampon has its leftovers, a two-piece bullet-shaped plastic inserter. It is this inserter which upsets us so, not only is it useless, since a woman can use her own fingers to place a tampon into her own vagina, but its manufacturer uses valuable and limited resources, and its disposal is questionable since it's plastic and does not break down. We are disappointed that your company has so little awareness of ecological and environmental concerns that it would foist such a wasteful and unnecessary product on the public, and then hand it out for free demanding that a market be created. We ask that you reconsider this product. It is not too late to reevaluate it and come up with a less wasteful way to help American women find a more convenient tampon. Sincerely, two readers in Minneapolis, CC, Ms. Magazine, 370 Lexington Avenue, New York, New York. Ms. Editor, is there something that you can do to encourage Ms. Readers to protest this product? Well, it seems pretty forward thinking, you know, environmentally forward thinking. Mm -hmm. that, that was 1978, and these women were like, please don't use all this plastic. Yeah, yeah. And I think about now, today, and just the options that women have in terms of uh, products for our menstrual cycles, mm -hmm. um, we, can, we can now decide and choose what we can use. Um, but I can imagine, like, receiving something in the mail and you didn't ask for it, and you get something that's just so insulting and um, um, wasteful. Um, that it's it's important that the two women that wrote this letter use their voice um, to find, and that Ms. Magazine was was there to um, provide a venue to um, say those things and to have a place to ask, you yeah. know, help. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, and just have like taboo tampons and menstruation is, and then to get something in the mail that's about your yeah. menstru menstrual cycle, yeah. and then that they, they have the savvy to realize like, oh, women are gonna get this and start using them mm -hmm. because you gave this free product, and yeah. how they were aware of kind of how manipulative that was. It's an interesting part of the letter. Mm -hmm. And we're also such a culture that is, um, wants convenience. Um, and uh, it played on that, the product did. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, mm -hmm. to have these two voices be um, conscious of that um, and say, hey, wait a second. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess growing up here, it seems like there's a stereotypical Minnesotan that I can yeah. see them <laughs> writing this letter. Yeah. Like, like, I'm not even that it was, it's a fall, like a depression era trickle down, but sort of it is. They're yeah. like, what is this plastic? Like, yeah. don't give me this. Yeah. 
like I save all my ball jars to be yeah. used then. <laughs> yeah, and also like my body is natural. Why didn't mm -hmm. things that are, are natural too? Right, put in the, I can use my fingers. Yeah. 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 Very practical. Mm -hmm. Really practical. Well, yeah, great. Dear editors, I wish to bring to your attention my experience at Auburn High School. I'm a 15-year-old sophomore and a member of the National Honor Society. I have no marks on my school record. In June, the girls started wearing halters to school. We have no dress code at the school. I wear a 36B bra. I was called to the office and vice principal told me if I wore another halter to school and disturbed the boys, I would be suspended regardless of my school record or the no dress code situation. He said, quote, boys will be boys. What are my rights as a girl? Why should I be suspended? Why can't boys accept my breasts as part of my body as I have been expected to not point out any parts of their bodies? Thank you. A reader in Auburn. Okay, yeah. Um, I feel really strongly about this letter because I think it touches a lot of points about equality. Um, I consider myself a feminist, feminist and, um, you know, boys get to wear whatever they want to school and nobody will say anything, but when girls wear what they want, they're always judged no matter what. In my school, um, the girls, we used to have this one um, teacher that was like the, uh, who went around and said what we could and couldn't wear, and, you know, some I understand, I mean, I think we need to dress respectfully. But we definitely have a choice in what we wear, um, and if it was if we had a dress code, that would be different. But we don't, so um, I think you know it's really important that self-expression is not censored um, when judging what, whether um, something is appropriate or not. So um, we can't wear, I mean, halters. Everything has to be two straps. Um, uh, we can't, our um, skirts or shorts couldn't be past our fingertips. And I mean, I think that's just a little extreme. I'm 26, divorced, and have one child, age four. I felt useless, washed out, and wasted. I've been working since age 16 as a waitress, sales clerk, and every kind of low-paying job. Then I got married and thought my life would be a husband, a home, and a child. Well, that ended bitterly, and here I was, back where I started. Just a high school diploma, plus a child to support. Back to being a waitress? No, I said I'm going to go to school. So I spent $1,000 and went to police school. I was determined to learn a trade. I graduated this year and then ventured out to find work. My town has one police matron and won't consider hiring another. The police station needed a dispatcher. I applied. No, we don't hire women. The policemen can't keep their minds on the job. So I went on to apply as a security guard. Our policy is we don't hire women, never have, never will. I tried another town who needed a police officer, period. No, women can't handle it alone. We don't hire females. Now what good is it, may I ask, to go to school to learn a trade and not get hired? Oh sure, Los Angeles or New York City or some metropolis will hire me, but I've grown up in the Midwest in a small town and I want to remain in a small town. Talk about injustice. I never was for women's liberation until I went to find a job. 
I think all men are chauvinist pigs now. I'd like to know what I can do about this. They know they're discriminating against females, and they smugly are getting away with it. I can't fight all of them with a civil rights suit against them. If there are any police women out there who have the answers, write to me in Mason City, Iowa, a reader in Mason City. what she was looking for and I hope that somebody gave her the opportunity to do what we know that anybody can do, male or female. Um, women are more than husbands and kids and homes. They have wants and desires and career goals and if we support them we can accomplish anything. Um, it's difficult at times you have to work twice as hard to do what the men do and you have to try to make it look easy to you know you don't want people to know that you're you may be struggling with something um, and there definitely are um, biases that people have against female police officers so um, that's something that women have to be mindful of too so, but there's nothing, there has not been one thing yet that I can't do because I'm a woman. Part of the English language. Your magazine has promoted the universal acceptance of Miss as a title addressed for women. Therefore, if you concur with the idea of a new word, you can be of considerable assistance. The proposed word is a han, meaning a, her, she, him, one. This would eliminate the need for the continued use of him and her, she and he. It also eliminates the use of woman, person, and female, all derived from forms of male nomenclature. People as a preferred word over person, and currently, I have some concern now over the use of humankind. What are the feelings of your readers? Sincerely, a reader in Emporia. Um, I don't know, like, it's almost eerie, actually, how the words in that in that letter were formed because they're very similar to thoughts that I've had and currently in like in four because I am very comfortable with the pronouns that I use. I'm very comfortable with being myself. I'm very comfortable with she and her. But I find it I find it maddening that so many people have trouble using the correct pronouns for me and addressing me as female and the idea of having a comfortable middle word that people could use, although I wouldn't prefer that, I wouldn't prefer them to use that, it would be a much easier go-between than them going, he, uh, she, uh, whatever. Because I'm not a whatever. I am definitely not a whatever. Um, just a person, so. It's a good idea. And people have trouble with they, even though it's, you know, Ben and the English language in the form of written word for many, many centuries, but people still struggle with it. And a new word? Why not? If we can invent, if we can invent bay, why not a mom? <laughs> um,
Dear Miss, I'm a 20 year old woman living alone for the first time in my life. Recently, I broke up with my first serious lover after living with her for over a year. I have come to the realization that I have made a very serious decision, one that cannot be reversed, nor should it be. I let my friends know that I was gay. That was more than two years ago. Last year, my mother found out and promptly sent me to a psychiatrist. She wanted him to call her and tell her what was wrong with me. Of course, he called and told her I was a normal young woman. And of course, she didn't accept this. She blamed the whole thing on my lover. I know my family probably knows. I know that a lot of people know about me, but I really just don't give a damn. I'm happy. I had a beautiful long affair with a tender woman. However, being a gay woman in the South is like having been black in the early 60s. My ex and I were once asked by an apartment manager if we had twin beds. We didn't and were refused the apartment. The gay bars are the only places to meet anyone. Of course, they're primarily gay males. Women are so reluctant to come out. Of course, the big cities like Atlanta or New Orleans offer a better life for gays, but not all of us can afford to live there. I don't resent my identity, who I am, or the labels on me. I don't resent the way my family feels about me. I have found my true family and the friends that have supported me and accepted me. I find it unfortunate that more women in the South do not come out and that those who do often go back. I'm a lot happier now than I have ever been, and I plan to stay this way. Youthful optimism. And if we get the state of the RA passed, we'll all be a lot happier. A reader in Birmingham. So there's a lot that I identify with in this letter, um, particularly that she names Atlanta and New Orleans, because there is such a narrative of I need to escape Birmingham. And if I'm going to stay in the South, of course, Atlanta. That's the only place I can go to get out and be happy and live my life. But it's still true that we can't just afford to leave monetarily and then socially for the, for the state. If everyone leaves, then that poor queer kid who lives in Birmingham, you know, who's going to be around for them? Um, so I know that I'm lucky and that I have the distance of some years on this writer. Uh, and that I've gotten to see things change for the better. I'm lucky that I get to work in an LGBTQ youth center, um, and I don't really see myself leaving. i not that I would shame anyone who decides to leave Birmingham, but I feel lucky that I feel like I should be here and I should be doing work here. Um, the only thing that really gives me pause in the letter is that the writer compares being gay to being black in the 60s which makes my ears just itch. Because <laughs> um, number one, a person can be both things. You can be black and gay. I'm standing here, a black gay Birminghamian. And number two, I understand the impulse, especially if you're from Birmingham, I understand you know, this horrific thing is happening to me. What's the most horrific thing I can reach to to compare it to? And being black in the 60s in Birmingham is horrific. But for that reason, it's not a good comparison because obviously what happened here in Birmingham for black folks in the 60s was, was water hoses, it was dogs, it was mass arrest, it was fearing for your life and your family's life and your kids' life, it was children marching in the street. Um, and I'm fairly certain that being gay in the 70s was not water hoses and dogs attacking you. Um, but nonetheless, I. I understand that compulsion to, to reach to something to compare it to, especially if you're writing a national magazine. Um, it's easy. People people know that for Birmingham, so if you want it to relate, that that's that's a go-to. But it doesn't it doesn't grasp intersectional feminist issues to make that easy comparison. Dear sisters, I am an undergraduate, and yesterday I took the law school admission test, LSAT. The whole thing was very depressing. There were about 50 men taking the test, and only four women, including me. It made me feel alone and alienated. It made me feel terribly irritated that more women don't feel they can make it in the legal profession. 
And it made me think of all the women I know who still think the only fields they can go into are nursing and teaching. And above all, that depressing ratio made me think, am I fooling myself? Can I make it in this man's world? Fortunately, today, I opened my mailbox and found my miss in it. I read the whole issue from cover to cover. I was cheered, supported, encouraged. The article on Jill Johnson gave me a particularly fine feeling. Thank you. Thank you for picking me up and for giving me strength to become the best damn lawyer around, a reader and mentor. Uh, I kind of empathize a lot with whoever wrote that letter, just knowing the kind of depressing feeling of walking into a room and staring and realizing that everybody here is more interested in cars and football while you're currently debating which kind of heels you want to wear that evening. Um, feeling like you either got to act like a really big tomboy or you're not going to survive or getting a lot of kind of negative feedback. My grandmother is from the 70s and she was a teacher and she often tells me that, hey, you can't become an engineer, that's too much schooling or you can't uh, do that, it's too much hard work, you're not going to make it with all the guys. Um, and and having a sister in the military here and now where you are, uh, am I allowed to swear? Uh, there's, there's two kinds of women in the Marine Corps. You're either a bitch or a slut. Um, hearing that constantly, it, it, it kind of resonates with me to have somebody who's kind of got that little bit of a sisterhood, and that's sort of the only thing that reminds you that you don't have to do the pre-assigned job position of nurse or teacher. So I really, really enjoy hearing more stuff like that. It's kind of good to know that those problems may have may still exist now, but there's still support groups to be found. So, yeah, that's my response. <laughs> what is the gender ratio in engineering? Um, there's a lot, a lot more guys in engineering than women, and it's perceived as something that's really, really intellectual. You have to be super smart to be an engineer. It's a lot of math. It's a lot of, you know, getting dirty with grease and engine oil, and that's sort of seen as a guy's thing. Um, math is for whatever reason perceived as a dude's game and, and women are said to be feelers and empathizers and guys are the thinkers and the analytics and you know what kind of creativity and, and skill I have to offer isn't the right kind for my particular field as a lot of uh, stereotypes are at least what I've experienced so thankfully that's not true and I'm hopefully working to disprove that with a uh, every little thing. My grandmother told me I couldn't make it through that much college because it was too much math and too much learning. And so now I'm like, mm, I guess I have to get my PhD out of spite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to be a biomedical engineer uh, focused in prosthetics. I'm going to be a prosthetician focused in upper body prosthetics. So I'm going to make robot arms for people. Dear editor, I am writing this letter as a response to the story, My Daddy Don't Work, which appeared in the August 1979 issue of Ms. Magazine. This story was, without exception, the most disgusting piece of drivel I've ever read in my life, and I would consider it a crime to allow anybody much less a child, to be exposed to such in 1979. It is not only an insult to black family life, but a real slap in the face to black manhood all over this country. Why must it be a black man who is not working, who cries in front of his wife and daughter, claiming that he's going to stop worrying about his unemployed status and become, in the meantime, the best cook there ever was. And I'll start by serving the best vegetable soup there ever was. The writer, Miss Nolan, obviously knows nothing about the psychology of manhood 
in this country, particularly black manhood, and nothing about the social and economic imperatives that make such a story absolutely preposterous, not only to Miss Nolan, the most obvious of visceral races, but the editors of this magazine who allowed such a story to appear are apparently ignorant of black life attitudes or they are dedicated to the perpetuation of derogatory racial stereotypes. Such a story is enough to discourage my subscribing to Miss Magazine. Sincerely, a reader in Bowling Green. <laughs> it's always been this tension between black and white feminists. In 1979, I just uh, graduated from college in 1973, and um, Ms. Magazine wasn't something ordinarily written to or read by a lot of black women in my circle, so when you mentioned this, I was surprised. Also, who was living in Bowling Green at the time? Um, so I thought that was unusual. But, um, now it's a matter of, I feel it as a personal responsibility to respond when I don't see our people represented in a way that I feel is fair. Um, the perception is that our lives are full of chaos and that kind of thing. And even though we were poor, I grew up in the projects, there was you know, tension around you, but it was because people weren't making a lot of money. But it doesn't mean we didn't have birthdays and anniversaries and that people, as you're walking through the neighborhood, one of the things I want to get across is there were lights on the porch, people looking out for you. And that's the way neighbors were. And if people just took the time to come down to our community, see, it's always a matter of us going to them, okay? But if they would come, and also to begin to develop businesses and things in the community. Uh, people would find most of us to be loving, hardworking Americans, but we're never referred to as Americans. Uh, the same thing with many other people who immigrated to this country. So anyway, I think it's, it was an important letter, and I'm glad they published it, um, you know, as a way of allowing that voice. They didn't. Oh! Oh, really? I'm honored. Really, that it's been archived and tucked away, you know, sort of like slave narratives. <laughs> That's terrific. That's terrific. Wow. I'm really moved. And, you know, this lady who took the time to write, never thought she'd be in a pub, you know, sort of put in. But now, so whoever she is, I'm honored to transport or give life to her words. And I really thank her for writing on behalf of my family to and put it in a, to try to put it in a public forum. So if you guys want, I don't know, we just have a few minutes and we started a little late, but if you guys want to ask any questions or you can probably stay. If you need to go, also don't feel bad because it is 6.15, but if anyone would like to ask questions right or hang out. Well, we have them around, but. Yeah. Yes? Um, I was curious about your use of like locations, like how you would select your locations for each to represent, like was it the, the person you were? Yeah, so the each person usually chooses the location. Um, and you let like, them choose. I let them choose, and I want it to not be an effort for people to participate. Um, so it's often where they live or right, where so they work or, 
Yeah, I, I tell people. I mean, I always tell people that I like to, I always film outside and it needs to be kind of public space and that's an important element of the project is to kind of think about public discourse and like literally placing it in a kind of visual public space. So that part is important. And yeah, I, tell, I mean, I tell them I like to film in ordinary neighborhoods. People, you know, sometimes, I don't always love the places people choose. Like people tend to want to pick extraordinary <laughs> locations rather than ordinary locations. So like a, you know, monument or park that they think is nice and I like shooting like on the street where people live but I, I do let people choose for the most part. What about their dress or wardrobe? They wear whatever they want. Right. Yeah. And makeup and all that. You just look oh no there's no makeup. Yeah. <laughs> it's you know I'm a documentary filmmaker. Actually I know this is a very performative project um, but I'm really not at all and they don't direct like I don't tell people how to read um, like I'm not interested in telling people how to appear in front of the camera but I'm much more interested in kind of what people bring to the interaction that we're having and whatever they think my expectation is or whatever they think is happening when they're reading and the camera is on like that's what I'm interested in. And that's the um. first reading right? No, so that's a good question. So when I started the project um, and I, I learned a lot so the first shooting I did, I spent like three weeks in Los Angeles and shot like a ton, a ton, a ton. I shot like 60 people just in Los Angeles, which is the most I've shot in one city. But as I was doing that, I was kind of learning what worked and what didn't work and how I wanted to work on the project. And like at that stage, it was still like totally an experiment in my head and I didn't know what it would feel like to do, including like at the beginning, I wasn't even asking people to respond to the letter and that's become like kind of the most interesting part of the project. Um, but when I started, I think I mistakenly, like, I imagined that the first read would be kind of this magical cold reading where all of the stuff would happen, um, and that's pretty much never true. Um, partly there's just an adjustment to the technology, and people are a little awkward at first, and the teleprompter is weird. Um, but actually what I found is that as people repeat the same words over and over again, it's like kind of on the third or fourth time where something interesting starts to happen. So even if like sometimes people are very moved when they read or they get emotional and it kind of happens over time and over repetition. Right. And I think there's something about putting those words into the body repeatedly that makes that happen. So it's almost never the first take that I'm using. I don't shoot tons of takes. I usually maybe, depending on the person and how long it takes them to get used to the reading, maybe like four or five. But and you don't give them any, any Coaching? No, nothing, no. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about your selection process? For today or in general? Or how you match the... Oh, how I match people with letters. So yeah, I have this, um, it's it idiosyncratic, so it's a, it's a complicated, it's kind of somewhere in between like magic and <laughs> spreadsheets and like being a relentless detective and I think all of those things are happening all the time. But so I have a survey, so one thing I do when I'm planning a trip is I'll just put out a social media call. And like, you know, at the beginning it was a lot of like friends and friends of friends and like way too many artists and filmmakers. Um, but as the project, the project has now grown a lot, so at this point total strangers sign up and it's much more diverse background wise and age wise and most of the people I have no idea how they learned about the project, so that's good. So over time it's kind of become much more of like uh, a kind of true encounter with strangers, which is what I hoped for at the beginning. Um, so when people find the project through social media, they usually sign up and I have a little survey that people sign up with, um, which I designed pretty carefully and I've also tweaked a lot over the course of working on the project. Um, but it, it kind of carefully asks, it's, it's short, I don't think it takes a long time to fill in, but I ask, I think, just enough questions. Um, that people sort of tell me a few things about themselves and what's important to them in a way that I think gives me ideas about how to pair people up in letters. Um, I don't always know, like I usually, when I write back to someone, I will propose a letter to them and kind of describe it and they'll tell me, they'll be like, oh, that's really exciting or that resonates with me a lot. So there's often a kind of discussion that's happening before we meet over email um, about what kind of letter might be interesting. Um, but other times I'm actually looking for very specific kinds of people and I have to do that work and they're not people who would naturally sign up. So like the Mason City, the woman who's a policewoman, like for that letter it was very important to me that it's in that place and that it's a policewoman and that's very specific and that's not going to just happen through even like a pretty broad social media call. So for that one I was like emailing police departments in Mason City and trying to 
like get you know access someone in that way. Um, so some letters I will work super hard on finding like the right kind of person, especially you know, if it's a small town, then that's usually outreach that I need to do. Um, if it's a letter about a specific job or situation where I feel like it feels important to find someone with a similar experience, then I'll look for that. Um, you know, I have some trick, like when it's a very small town, one of the first things I often do is write to the local historical society. Like most small towns have like some kind of little basement or one room museum that's a historical society. And the volunteer or two that work there are usually very excited about the history of their town and they get into my project and they're often very helpful kind of connecting me with people in the small town where they know everyone. So yeah, I do, it's for different letters, it's different type of work, but it's kind of a combination of organically people who come into the project and then work that I do to, on top of that, look for specific people in specific communities. Yeah? So what kind of issue are you raising like, through this work? Like I know kind of what, you know, watching all these things in your own, you like reading the letters and mm -hmm. seeing what people's thoughts are, but I just kind of want to hear from you what issue you wanted to kind of... What, kind, what issue did you get out of seeing all of this? I was just like, you know, person Yeah, I mean, I think I'm interested. I mean, I would not say there's one issue. I think I have questions that I'm interested in rather than issues that I'm interested in. Um, I mean, an issue like in terms of actual issues, there's lots and lots of issues that come up across the letters and across the different readings. Um, but, you know, I think really broadly, I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of the conversations that people were having in the 70s are still conversations that feel important and unfinished and unresolved. And I think through inviting people to engage with the letters, a lot of that comes out. Um, and I'm interested, you know, I think there's also a way, I think people who write about histories of feminism, like a thing that comes up again and again and again is that there's this kind of historical amnesia that happens a lot with feminism specifically, where kind of every wave, new wave of feminists or new generation of feminists really forgets and disavows and pushes back against whatever came before it. And you know, that can be productive in certain ways, you know, certainly like people, like young women or young people who are feminists now, um, and not just women, right? It's much more inclusive to a broader gender spectrum and you know, feminist men and trans people and much more conversation about intersectional feminism. And you know, all of that has really evolved since the 70s. And that's great. Um, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of forgetfulness about like work that was done in the 70s about, you know, like when I started reading these letters, the whole first folder of letters that I read was written by women who couldn't get bank accounts because they were women and couldn't wear pants to work because they were women. And that's just 40 years ago. And I think there's a way that um, certainly like my students or people who are in their 20s or younger, it's hard to remember or reach for that moment. Um, so I think to me there's this idea of staging a conversation between the past and the present that feels important to me. So I guess I would, yeah, that's kind of the center of the project for me. Yeah. Um, what was like your starting point from like deciding to read the letters up until like making it into what you did? Um, so I think I kind of knew what I wanted to do even before I read the letters. And I had made the project that Courtney mentioned called Maternity Test. So I made a couple of other pieces that use teleprompter readings and invite people to encounter some kind of text that I find somewhere. So the technique that I use, it evolved a lot in this project. And before I was making these pieces, like in a studio with my laptop on a table, so it was like much lower tech. It's not, it's not totally dark. Um, but yeah, so I kind of, but I knew already that I'm interested in this thing that happens when people read stuff on a teleprompter and that I like that. Um, so I thought I kind of had that idea from the beginning. I think before I even read the letter, like I just knew that the letters were collected and I knew they would be interesting. Um, but then a lot of stuff, like the idea of traveling from place to place, that came out of just reading the letters and really feeling like that was important to the letters and that letters from different places felt like they had really different concerns. Um, and inviting people to respond kind of happened as I was shooting. Like it, I think it probably just happened spontaneously and then it was interesting and then I kept doing it. Um, so definitely it's changed as I've, like, through doing it. But I think the basic idea 
having people read these letters that it kind of viewed from the beginning. Yeah? Not really a question, just an observation. I really enjoyed those compositions of that in-between time of the atmosphere you're creating and, and how that kind of leads into those conversations. And really what I enjoyed about that is the takeaway of the accessibility of just people that would be your neighbor or, you know, I really, really love that accessible nature of, of how they were reading, very personable, very um, vulnerable in a way that even makes that reading, I think, even more powerful mm -hmm. um, and poignant in, in, the, in that purity of moment. I just, and I, and I just love those compositions that you made after the fact. And I, mm -hmm. the other thing I really enjoyed was how you let that thought linger for a few seconds after they did that reading. You get to kind of read into the body mm -hmm. language and the psychology and, and them really processing what they just said. Mm -hmm. um, really, really very telling. Just really, really a conceptually beautiful project. And, Thank you. And really tremendous um, to go into that kind of level of, of execution is really astonishing. So Thank tremendous you. work. Yeah. Really Thank you so much. Yeah. I think it was maybe 40 years ago that was it Finnehoff made first name Bia. Mm -hmm. Do you have, do you want to talk a little bit about how she was kind of exploring the same space of women's experiences. I mean, she's transcending uh, nationality and mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. by having women from the United States read letters and mm -hmm. monologues, basically, from women from Vietnam. Yeah, that's and interesting. Yeah. More, right? That's actually totally not a film that is on, when I kind of think about what my models are for this film, yeah. that hasn't been a film. But I know that work, and I really love that work. Mm -hmm. and. I think I used to think a lot about Trin Minha as a model for work I was doing when I was making more, when I was traveling more and kind of thinking more about ethnography and working across cultures. Um, but it's interesting that you bring that up because I, I actually hadn't thought about that film at all as a, a model. That's exactly where I went. Like, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I do have like films that I think of as kind of conceptual models for, for the different things I'm interested in here. Um, and that actually hasn't been one, but that's interesting. I will um, should think about that. Um, and yeah, she does, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, she is kind of, she's someone who thinks about documentary in ways that really explode that as a category and thinks a lot about performance and disrupting kind of what we understand about documentary and thinking really carefully about dynamics between kind of where she places herself as a maker and where she is in terms of like culture and people she's working with. Um, so yeah, I think all of those things are kind of part of my, like, I guess, filmmaker DNA a little bit. Like I looked at that work a long time ago at the beginning of my film career and read a lot of her writing. Um, but I don't know that that work has been like an immediate. And, but I think that work is kind of a background influence for sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.